you all for coming tonight. Thank you for joining us, Severi. Severi? Yeah, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Startup Grind is active now in 600 cities around the world. So if you are looking to connect somewhere around the world, um, there's Aliki, who's also wearing the Startup Grind t-shirt. She's my co-director. And between Aliki and I, we can put you in touch with uh, founders and, and um, ecosystem uh, key people that are, um, who know the ecosystem in other cities. So if you need to connect somewhere, uh, around the world, happy to do that and put you in touch. Here. But we usually like to start our, our Startup Grind events and our, our, our talks and, and interviews with finding out a little bit more about you personally. Where do you come from? Yeah, I'm, s I'm Swiss. I'm not... You're born here in Switzerland. Born yeah, I'm not very exotic, so I'm Swiss <laughs> from both sides. Yep. Um, but I come from the French part of Switzerland, that okay. would be... <laughs> Where is that? Uh, in Valais. Yeah. yeah, the mountains part. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm in Zurich since seven years. Okay. Yeah, seven years, yeah. And um, as a kid, when you were growing up, did you already think that you would be running a business one day? <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. Um, so I'm not the, like the perfect entrepreneurs from the books that used to sell stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> when they were kids. Um, I just think the, the trade that I have had as a kid that helped me build a business is um, I would always like to do things by myself, mm -hmm. which might be good or not. But um, I think that would be the trade that I still have, like this energy to yeah, do things and do it by myself and try it out. Yeah. Did you know uh, or did you have something in mind when you were a kid that you <coughs> dreamed of doing? Yeah, I had some dream careers being, <laughs> at the, I wanted to be a double agent. <laughs> <laughs> double. Yeah, double, no, not simple agent, double agent, like really get the thrill out of it. <laughs> um, I didn't want to study criminology, so I, it's, yeah, kind of something with criminals, I like that. Um, but. Then I also always, always had arts, so mm -hmm. I always played the piano, so there was always the things, arts and criminals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 um, no, but then I, I got really interested in neuroscience, so the mm -hmm. whole how the brain works. Um, and this is mainly why I studied um, health sciences and technologies in Zurich, was to go into the brain, okay. which is not, it's a good, things for criminals and for arts. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. You need creativity. Mm-hmm, in both. <laughs> well, your double agent kind of comes into play now with you being a, a CTO and working with people, so you both the technology and the people side. Yeah, so this is something that my, my co-founder uh, says about me, that I'm the CTO with the people skills. Um, I just think I'm a normal person. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about uh, your company. What, what, what is it that you guys do? Um, so uh, we are building sensors uh, for measuring brain, heart and muscle activity. And we are doing so with the vision or why we started was to um, have actually sensors that you can forget uh, because we always had like uh, clinical sensors that are uncomfortable so people don't wear them. So it was how do we get data out of people who are um, is healthy. Mm. So we think, okay, you have to not feel it and still have good signal. So that's where we started developing new materials to combine these two um, comfort and signal quality. And um, that's what we still do. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you, you, the main focus is on the, the sensors, but you also have um, some grasshoppers in there or something like that. Yeah, this is the super highly nice engineered uh, solution mm -hmm. from the, my master thesis at ETH. Um, so the idea here was that uh, we started to understand that um, adhesion to the skin is one big problem um, in the sensors. And so I got inspired by nature, like the insects uh, that adhere to surfaces without any glue. Mm. And this is a geometrical adhesion, so it's just based on how the things are um, put together. And so we just reproduced um, those structures with our materials. 
so that it would adhere better on the skin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I said also highly, super nice engineered. Uh, this is one of the problems from coming from the lab and going on the market. It's super tough to manufacture on big scale. Right. It used to be very easy in the lab. For me, it was like, yeah, I can do it, anyone can do it, but that's not true. No, uh, not in a production line. No, it isn't, not yet. Uh, so it takes a long time to get to the market. So we have focused on simpler version of the materials that also work better than the rest, and it's going to be fine for the first product. Okay. And where are you with, with that? Do you have, uh, like, um, or how soon do you plan to have it on the market? Or hope to have it on the market? Yeah, it's always a defi definition on, uh, on the market, yeah. I think. Uh, so we are having our first order for an online shop in the States. Uh, but this is also for brain hacker and brain research community. So it, More specialized? Or yeah, it's not, not going Not the general public? Yeah, it's not the general public yet, and it doesn't need to be um, super nice and industrialized yet. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be our first entry into market. Um, and then the thing is that we are working on a B2B, so we are working with the device manufacturer. Okay. So it also depends on when he is bringing the product to the market. Um, and we expect er early next year to have the first product with our electrodes into it. So it's it's a it's a sensor, mm -hmm. and the I mean because there's lots of sensors out there. Yeah. Um, but uh, on top of being a, 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 a new or special sensor is uh, the way that it attaches to the body. Is that the the, the biggest breakthrough? Um, I'd say the biggest breakthrough is that um, it's super comfortable and it still gives you signal quality that the doctor can read through it. Did you bring one tonight? <laughs> I didn't actually. No, I didn't. Okay. No, but and the the problem that all of our customers have it's called motion artifacts. Yeah. So it's actually when people start moving, they cannot read the signals anymore because noise from movement mm -hmm. is bigger than noise from the signal. Um, and usually, you want to measure moving people or not dead people so you want to measure people who are moving um, and this combination of materials really increase the, the signal quality while moving okay. so it's a very good sensor for the everyday life where we want to go into okay. you know? and uh, did you um I, I guess in the startup community there's you you network with a lot of people you meet other founders and yeah. Do you find it being better or worse or any advantage to being a very young founder? <laughs> I'm not very young. You just look like I am. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, I would say uh, if you're in America pitching, they actually quite like it hmm. because they have this famous, ah, oh, there are young kids doing the stuff out of the garage, it's going to be the next big thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be an advantage. Um, I mean, for customers specifically, it, depending on where you are, like <laughs> German customer, for example, they're very traditional. Um, you say your last name and that's it, and it's very formal. So me looking like I'm <laughs> almost 18, uh, <laughs> it, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily help, right. but I mean, what can I do? <laughs> <laughs> so you just, that's why you went to the US market first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a bit easier, yeah. like for the pitching. Um, you were, are you, I guess, are you still doing research at the ETH or you've transitioned fully into, into yeah. and how, how, do, how is that the transition to, to go from uh, studying and doing the research to being a, a startup founder and running a company? Uh, I was quite happy about it uh, because, um, yeah, I mean, I like to be in the lab, but not for too long. Um, so Not enough criminals. <laughs> I never know. Um, <laughs> um, no, but um, we, the first people that we hired were specifically people to take on the work in the lab because, um, I mean, other people can do it much better than me. And um, so for me, it was more, uh, I'm actually quite happy that I don't have to go to the lab. I think it is, that's good for the company. Mm. 
engineering also it tends to be more of a male dominant environment. <laughs> yeah. And how have, how have you how do you feel in that space and um, has there been any any challenges from it, that perspective? No. Um, basically, no. I mean. Um, I have to think about this one. Um, I, I always got along with men and boys, like from always. Mm -hmm. um, then I studied at ETH. Um, yeah, it, it's also male dominated, but I think it's still very um, inclusive. And I always say like, I think engineering, it's better for women than other um, areas because at some point you kind of connect on another level than the body. It's like more on brainstorming and thinking about ideas and being inventive. And I think at some point it really doesn't matter what body the other person is into. So at least it doesn't make a difference for me. So um, yeah, it's not, it's not have been really a challenge mm -hmm. for me. Okay. Because um, yeah. it's not only in, in, I guess, in engineering, but uh, in the startup world or in the business world, it's often a, you know, the challenge mm. to, um, uh, to find that balance and the equality and, and the diversity in, in teams and in, in, in companies. How is, how is that playing out in the, how, how big is your team in your company? Uh, we are eight people right now. Mm -hmm. And we have, a, actually we are 50-50. Mm -hmm. uh, male, female, it's not something that we specifically, we don't have a quota yeah. or something like this. But a lot of women um, actually want to work with us. Mm -hmm. So um, we got really good candidates, which are females. And I think the, the, uh, the space where I see the most as an investor is uh, very, very few female investors. Um, I think it's... Yeah, it's a bit of a pity, but I think it's coming. So it's going to get better. And you met your, your co-founder at ETH, right? Yes. Yeah, so um, does he do uh, more of the, the pitching, or you guys do it together, or you take turns, or how does that um, So he does most of the pitching. Mm -hmm. um, he's also very good at pitching, I have to say. He has a, a secret career in a rap battling, so he's really good <laughs> at pitching. <laughs> um, but I also do pitches sometimes if he doesn't have time or if we split. And it's, it depends on the lens of it. If it's like longer than three minutes or five minutes, we, we usually split it. Uh, but if it's like short pitches of one to three minutes, one person does it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think it helps, uh, I mean, like being a woman um, to have a he always supports me a lot uh, when we are with investors. He always gives me a lot of uh, credits. Yeah. So I think that helps a lot also. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, well, you mentioned that you're starting with the, the American market more, the US market, but uh, how do you see the, the wearables in general in the market? Is that something that's more active in, in other countries? It, how is it compared to Europe, compared to Switzerland? Uh, yeah, so there is a, quite a lot of startups in the US in wearable. Mm -hmm. So this is a very uh, important market for us. Um, I'd say in Europe there are some, like France is not that bad actually. Um, but Europe is a bit, it's n not so much on the forefront of wearables. Switzerland, not at all. It's more the research part that are quite good in Switzerland. And China. Uh, China is also okay. a big market for us in the wearables. Hmm. Yeah. And what do you see as the, the future of wearables? Where do you see that going? Uh, <laughs> I always say it really depends on the software. <laughs> um, because, uh, I mean, just having data, if you cannot work on it, yeah. uh, if you cannot do anything with it, if the input is always the same, but it doesn't help you, um, that's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it really depends on the application behind it. But I truly believe in it. And there are really cool applications coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> are you guys also developing software or just the hardware? So we have hardware and software, but it's for testing uh, so that we get the raw data. Um, but we are thinking strategically into 
going into putting adding some hardware on it, but no software. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And from so biomonitoring is not how did, how did you go from engineering to biomonitoring? <laughs> Now we started with biomonitoring, we went into engineering uh, because we started with the idea to do something about, um, about the health monitoring market. Mm. So and then we started at As an engineer ask. studying engineering, um, <laughs> how, did, how did the biomonitoring... How did that happen? Yeah. Um, so I always liked sensors, developing sensors, so I always I focused a bit on, I focused on this during my studies and my co-founder, he used to work in a company doing burnout prevention with heart rate variability uh, besides studying. And then we met and we both wanted to do a company. He was more into biomonitoring, I was more into uh, sensors, it doesn't matter what, but sensors. Um, that's how we got together and then we went on looking for a lab to develop the sensor. Okay. Yeah. How long ago did you start? Like with the idea, it's uh, four years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, and then as a company, we founded in uh, November two years ago. Okay. So what almost is, two. Yeah. And what does your your average day look like? What is it mm -hmm. like being an entrepreneur? <laughs> it depends. Um, so there are a few days in the month where it's a like a office month where I can read emails <laughs> and just do that. Uh, but mostly so we have a lot of internal meetings because we're testing a lot. So to think about the, the new results, uh, we also uh, try to talk a lot with the customers. Mm -hmm. Currently we are a lot with investors and um, we are traveling quite a lot for events, I would say important events, or visiting um, customers and acquiring new ones. So it's a bit of traveling, emails, meetings. We, we game a lot, like uh, Tekeli Kashta. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of Tekeli Kashta. That's uh, table football. Yeah, table yeah. football. Nice. Um, if someone has a, a question from the audience, feel free to just raise your hand and we'll also take questions from, from you guys as well. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned customers. Who are your customers? So our customers are uh, typically companies that develop hardware and software for specific applications. So we have companies in meditation, so we're uh, measuring your brain activity during meditation. Or um, we have also car companies who want to connect your body with the cars. Um, or sports application. We have some gaming companies, um, either like doing suits with sensors um, so that they measure the movement so that, for example, you can just, instead of having a remote controller, move. Um, so there's yeah, all companies that actually want to measure something from the body and do something about it. Um, it's interesting. I started with near feedback about oh. 21 years ago and I got involved heavily. Mm -hmm. And I do have a wearing, I, I do have a sensor, uh, the wearable sensing, you've heard of mm -hmm. wearable sensing? Yeah, yeah. I have that cap now that I've been using for about three or four years. Very um, interesting. When I first started with the near feedback, um, a lot of the people said, we've got to contact the doctors. And I said, why? Why do that? Mm -hmm. Because the doctors at the time, uh, they were making money. What, why change? Mm -hmm. So I said, what we have to do is we have to do good work. And so what's happening now is that the people are asking for it. And of course, the doctors and psychologists are responding. But still, the, the pharmaceutical companies, they got a lot of money. And they're still fighting it internationally mm -hmm. because it's, it's non-invasive. And of course, the medication is invasive. So mm. there seems to be quite a battle going on. But I see now that there is a demand for these devices. No doubt about it. Yeah. So we've seen also that a lot of um, innovation and startups are coming in the non-invasive market because th this is also the thing, the invasive market, um, it's promising, but it's like 20 years down the road uh, for invasive sensors. Um, and you can do stuff non-invasively. 
Um, so we think this is the approach to go, like everything that can be worn at home, where you can train yourself or um, how do you say also for neural feedback, there are some companies also like stimulating with uh, uh, sounds or uh, so I think we can do a lot um, in the market with non-invasive technologies. And well, I really believe in this and I'm passionate about those technologies. So, uh, but how, how is your experience uh, with wearable sensing? With the wearable? Yeah. Well, the wearable is great because I can train myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, the, the wearable is training because I can put the cap on myself and then I can train myself. Because mm -hmm. now at my age, uh, of course, my brain is changing. So one of the biggest issues, of course, is, is memory. Mm -hmm. and, and so what I'm doing is training that. But there's also other stuff now, electrical stimulation and all this stuff. Yeah. But I found with the near feedback, what we did was it's called self-regulation. Mm -hmm. So it was a more of a training. It's a loop, yeah. Uh, that, that loop, rather than if it's being stimulated, then I'm not learning. Yeah. Uh, also, I do the heart rate variability. I've been doing that for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I got involved with a guy from California, and we created this software. And, and so what you can do is you can keep track of the history of how you did from time to time. Mm -hmm. But what he found was is that that also would create anxiety because then people were focused on, on, on perfection. Mm -hmm. I have to be better. I have to be better. Rather than focusing on the day and saying, okay, I'm going to train today, and that's what I find even with my clients. If I start talking about how you do from the past, then there's that, I have to do better, I have to mm -hmm. do better. And that's what I found right now. The biggest problem today is the anxiety issues. Yeah, and that's interesting. And so the meditation side is yeah. really important. The calming and the, and, and the letting go side uh, is really the biggest challenge. So I'm working with one fellow over there, and we're going to try and encourage independence, which is self-regulation, yeah. rather than control and focus. Yeah, that's also very uh, interesting and trending, the meditation. So there's headspace, I mean, like, probably now a lot of you have tried. And there's Muse headbands to help you meditate. And uh, I really feel like meditation is also something that is very much coming into Europe. Um, I mean, in America, when you go to California and you go to the hairdresser, they're all talking about it. It is a meditation course and come and come meditate with me for an hour. So there they do it a lot. And um, in, yeah, in Europe, it's starting to become a very big topic on how to self-regulate. Yeah, one of the biggest problems I found with, with a lot of you get these equipments, one's called the Muse. Yeah. And what they do is that they start stimulating. What I found was is that everybody's different, okay? So if we talk about frequencies, we can talk mm -hmm. about theta and alpha. What I started out to do, I would train somebody for alpha theta training, mm -hmm. calming them down, but then there was people that had too much theta. So what I was doing was I was encouraging them to, and I was training them to be more out of it. Yeah. So then you get into training the different alpha. So that's where I think the brain mapping is so important. Yeah. And that's what I think that's the key mm. because there can be people that are training themselves. And I talked to a guy from the States who does also electrical stimulation. Mm -hmm. And some people are doing their own, their own self stimulation and, and it, they can really almost fry themselves. Yeah, that's, that's one of the problems that we've seen with those devices. Is actually, how you said, it's like they don't measure it before. You don't do a brain mapping before. So it's more like black box. Uh, stimulation or black box, black box um, measuring, but I also think the key would be to have measuring devices that are uh, very comfortable. Because if you want to do a brain mapping right now, it's not very comfortable and it's not very cheap. So <laughs> to have something that you can do at home for brain mapping, like a first, like a, when you calibrate a device, for example, and then adapt it on the stimulation or the, the workout you're doing, um, that, I think that would be key to have something specific to a person, yeah. But um, I will need your card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 It's been a pleasure. I didn't yeah. know you're, this is going to be the discussion. Right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> me neither, so <laughs> I'm happy too. <laughs> Uh, I'll let somebody else. <laughs> Can you tell us a bit about your fundraising experience? Mm -hmm. So uh, we did the first fundraising one year ago. Um, it was um, 
less of uh, less than a million fundraising. So this was quite, I'd say, it's not, it's never easy, but it was, um, it's more the the first fundraising. It's like people like you, people. You have a technology from the ETH, just helps a lot. Um, because they really believe it works, even though they don't <laughs> check it. Um, then, so it was uh, business angels, and there it's very, um, I mean, it's it, it's very on how, how they like you and how you present. And here in Switzerland. Yes, here in Switzerland. So the first fundraising was here in Switzerland. So we had also good networks. Uh, so we did an accelerator, which is called the um, Swiss Startup Factory, and they have a very good network of business angels. So for the first rounds, it was uh, very easy. Uh, for this round, you're doing the Series A now. Yeah, we wanted to do Series A, but we are doing a convertible loan until we do the Series A because specifically um, uh, for VCs, uh, for venture capitalist money, it's just a little bit too early on the commercialization route roadmap. Uh, so it's kind of okay. So we're gonna just raise something in between so that we get there and get the professional money in it. But it's hardware, so hardware is always takes longer. So I think hardware is one of the hard parts of fundraising. Uh, you have to have people who are patient um, and kind of understand it. Um, but it, it works. I mean, it's um, it's possible. <laughs> Would you advise um, uh, in general people not to take funding early to try to bootstrap as long as possible, or what's your perspective on that? Yeah, it depends if you can bootstrap, um, but yeah, I don't know. It depends what you're doing. Uh, if you're into hardware and you know you have a development time of two to three years and you have to get good people on board, um, I would rather go for... Um, funding right away. Yeah, I would rather go for funding right away and maybe give a bit more equity. Mm. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm not very patient also, I have to say, so I like to, yeah, to build it and do it as fast as I can. So for me, yeah. If you can bootstrap, it's it's not bad either. But then I, I don't know. You have to just bootstrap just as long as you need to have a good valuation, but not more. I think at some point afterwards, if you want to make it grow bigger, it doesn't necessarily make sense to just bootstrap. Right. Did um, the publicity you got from being in the Forbes 30 Under 30 did that help? Um, either from from a business perspective or from a fundraising perspective? Mm. Was it a surprise when you and Simon found out? Well, um, the, the ETH told us that they wanted to um, to try to get us on Forbes. Yeah. So it was like, not like surprise, surprise. Yeah. Um, we knew it could happen. But still, I mean, it's quite cool. I mean, because, um, yeah, I mean, you're doing something and Forbes 3030 thinks it's so amazing that you belong there and mm -hmm. it's like, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I wouldn't say that this is really, I mean, it's a good publicity, but uh, I didn't really have a direct um, outcome of this publicity. Right. For example, we were in the um, Tagess show and the news, the mm -hmm. Swiss news, and it was huge. Like. A lot of companies contacted us for customers. So this was really, really good uh, for publicity. Forbes 30 under 30, it's more, I mean, like right now, I don't know, I'm also on LinkedIn and seeing all those people getting Forbes 30 under 30. I think it's a bit like, yeah, everybody's getting it mm -hmm. a bit. So, yeah. Yeah, but it's, my, it's my, my LinkedIn. Uh, I see a lot of them, that, so maybe that's why I have this feeling. Um, what advice would you give to a young you? A younger. A younger me? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> um, I would start earlier. Yeah. Would you have done anything different besides starting early? No, but I think I would have. Um, I would have made like uh, some experience and how to build a team and how to work with people um, that would have helped me for this one, for example. So yeah, maybe 
not start this one earlier, but just uh, during your studies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have another a startup. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And um, I guess another topic that's often amongst uh, you know, founders is you know once you, for example, you and Simon, then you probably had the first person you got on your team was someone you knew well, but then at some point in time you have to start hiring people you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, what, what can you say about that experience, about hiring people? Or is or still the team is not so big? Is everyone from your close network? or um, Not everyone. Um, so we had an official hiring uh, session. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the thing I would say that we are also doing right now is um, when you hire people in a startup, the real hires, those are people who have been working in big corporates or larger corporates usually, uh, and those are not founders. Um, so there is a huge expectation gap that you don't realize until mm -hmm. you realize it. Um, <laughs> so it would be like be much more specific on what you expect from the mindset of those people, because like basic example for us, uh, Simon and myself, we've never been working in big corporate, so we don't know those structures. Um, so for us, it was like, we expected without saying it, that uh, you would have your own ideas, that you would um, come and challenge us, that you would take responsibility and just do your thing and be happy doing your thing. And they had the expectation uh, and not telling us because we are, they are our employees, so how should, why should it tell us what's their expectation of having guidance, of having someone to tell them, yeah, what to do and how to do it and how we want it. So big clash of culture. <laughs> so we went on for two to three months and everyone got like very stressed, like very unhappy. Yeah. And then we got this, okay, we have to... Sort it out. To sort it out. So now what we're doing uh, for the second round of hiring is really telling, hey, I want you to do actually this, 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 but it's also on the mindset. I want you to take responsibilities. I want you um, to, if you think this is a good idea for the company, take the credit card and order it. That's, you can do that. Mm -hmm. Telling them what they can do. Giving them the, the, the freedom. freedom, yeah. What is, what is something, so you said right now you're hiring, mm -hmm. what is something you look for people besides the specific talents that they bring? You know, so if you're looking for an engineer or a salesperson, obviously you want them to be a good salesperson. Mm -hmm. But uh, what do you look for when hiring someone? Uh, Simon and myself, we we're very uh, into how we sparkle, we we'll spark with a person. So first we have usually interviews and we talk yeah, we like to see how the person is interacting with us and if we if they can feel... Play table football. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, and how, um, yeah, how we interact with this person, if there is this like vibe or not. And then usually we do give them an assessment uh, on which is specifically on the company in their role. So, for example, salesperson, um, how would you structure um, the sales pipeline for Neurotech. And this is his assignment on the second um, hiring process. And then we bring the whole team in because it's very important for us that the team interacts well with mm -hmm. those people. So it's, uh, yeah, I'd say it's the spark. We look mm -hmm. for the spark. And now we know how to ask specific, more specific questions to yeah. understand how this person might be working in the team, yeah. <laughs> so this might be interesting for the big corporate companies mm -hmm. also. Um, a lot of firms complain that they can't find a lot of good women in the technical industry. Mm -hmm. However, you seem to find a lot of qualified women. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? And do you have any tips <laughs> for these companies? Yes, I do. Um, so, um, first of all, I asked my, the, the, the women that work for us, and I asked them, so how come you, or you wanted to work for, uh, with us? And they told me, you have a, like a vibe um, kind of, uh, 
you're, you're cool people and you seem to be very inclusive, like the way you, you, we see you on the internet. Um, second, how you write the offers, like how the, the, the offers. Um, I, I believe women, if they don't feel like 90% perfect, they might say, oh, uh, maybe I'm not going to try. So I think it's about how you write uh, the offer, the job offer. Um, we always put a touch on, we care about you as a person, uh, that you're going to be happy working with us also. And I think, then, yeah, I think quite a lot of women feel comfortable to apply. And yeah, I would say just think a little bit of how specific you write your job offer um, with the experience you have to have at least, da -da -da, at least this and this and this and that. And maybe on last liner could be, um, but if you're a very cool person, you don't need to have all that. <laughs> yeah. So making it more human. Yes, yes, more approachable. Def definitely more approachable, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's true. I mean, um, I think at one of the last events we were talking about that as well. And uh, there was a, uh, I forget who it was, they did, they did you know, um, had some job offers out and significant more amount of men who applied for it, but then mm -hmm. most of the men who applied for it were not qualified, mm -hmm. yet they still applied for it. So there's both sides. There is, on the one hand, plenty of, of men who, because that's the male perspectives like no try it anyways mm -hmm. like you said women are are a lot more careful if it doesn't take all the boxes then yeah so there is on the one hand encouraging women to to try more yeah and on the other hand making your your offer more approachable and say that there is leeway mm -hmm. um, and because often you always see especially from corporate offers that, you know we're an equal opportunity blah 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 but that's that doesn't, that's just corporate jargon that doesn't yeah. actually speak to anyone and you make them comfortable. Yeah, I mean, you have to have the pool that apply, but then you're definitely going to find good women. Mm -hmm. But if they don't apply, then yeah, then it's going to be harder. <laughs> yeah. Back to you. Um, go ahead. Yes. Because I was going to change the subject. With that. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I was wondering. Um, after two years, I imagine you also had to maybe fire someone. Um, <laughs> no company culture and stuff, and you know, looking so innocent and being a person. <laughs> Do I? Um, I can hardly imagine how you, you know, like we say, um, hire slow, fire fast. Um, have you had any of those expectations or any of those experiences? That. Yeah, so short answer, we haven't fired anyone yet, which doesn't mean it's good. Um, so we had like, I said we had this clash of mindset, so we kind of wanted to give them a chance also because we also took responsibility for us not really telling them what we wanted them to be. Um, and. It really worked out quite well, I have to say. They changed quite a lot. Um, so we haven't fired anyone yet. Um, but we thought about it <laughs> a little bit. But mainly we're quite happy about the people that we hired, I have to say. But I will, I'll see the next round of people that we employ might be different. Um, you, you never know, like, even if you spark with someone in the interview, sometimes it works completely differently in the working dynamic and it's hard to find that out in the interviews. So I'll let you know maybe next year. <laughs> um, I have a question on hiring as well. Like uh, um, initially how did you, because you know we, I assume with funding is limited so mm -hmm. you can only hire a certain number of people, you can't have people for each cut, you know, each each position. So mm -hmm. how did you decide um, what type of position you should hire first? So for example, some startup will hire sales straight away and before they expand the tech team. Mm -hmm. and some startup will not even hire one sales specialist until two years down the you know down the road. So how do you do make this decision? Did you receive any assistance or so um, I would say 
uh, regarding the hiring the salesperson. So we are we are Swiss. We don't hire a salesperson before we have a perfect product. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but it's more like the, if you go in the American mindset, usually the first hire, it's going to be a salesperson, but which is actually really not bad. Um, so <laughs> maybe we should have been hiring a salesperson sooner. Um, so the first was, OK, we have like a lab prototype, uh, but we have to we want to have customers. So as Swiss, we thought, OK, we have to have a better product. <laughs> we didn't think we have to have someone that sells our prototype. So we hired people to work on, on the production and on industrialization of the production. And I knew what we needed was something in the processing and in the material. So those are our first hires. Um, but yeah, I mean, we could have done it a bit differently also. But that's the way we, we started as ETH. Swiss people. <laughs> yeah. Back a little bit to the topic of funding. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a planned exit strategy? Hmm. Are you touching the wunde punkt? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, it's like a, do we have a strategy? Well, because some people say, no, I'm never going to sell my baby. I'm going to want to build it big. And other people are like, yeah, I'm, I want to sell it and, and move on to the next thing. And some people enjoy that starting again and are serial I, entrepreneurs yeah. and serial founders. And we, we don't know yet. Actually, we're not sure yet. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that we are, the people are going to say we don't want to sell. Mm -hmm. the, that's not it. I think at some point we will take into account uh, to sell, um, if it's the whole business or if it's just a part of the business, uh, we don't know yet. So we've been thinking like lately, okay, but how long do we want to stay with the company and how does the company have to look like if we want to stay long? Yeah. And we really like to develop new products. Uh, so they're still ha going to have this dynamic that we don't sell. Mm -hmm. If at some point we have a product that sells super well, but it's like just optimizing the packaging or the post office um, contracts, I don't think we're, we're going to be super happy like personally with right. that. So maybe that would be a point where we sell. Uh, but yeah, there is no clear strategy, really not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's a um, it's both a business question and a personal question. Mm -hmm. and some your your VC investors will be curious about that, but then also it's from your own personal <laughs> set, and it, it makes sense. I mean, if you're a creator and a creative person, then mm -hmm. you know it does make sense to to think about the long terms. Like, how are we going to keep this company as a creative company and forever, yeah. or do we have to create something else? Yeah. That's the question. But something that we really want to see is that if we sell it. Um, the partner that we sell it to makes it somehow bigger mm -hmm. or access to a larger market, um, something like this. Mm -hmm. That would make us happy <laughs> if we sell. And have you had any um, moments of uh, failure in the company? Mm -hmm. And how did you deal with that? Um, let me think about it because we must have had some. <laughs> um, or personally, where you felt uh, was a, a mistake or... Yeah, for me, like the, the, the thing that are personally for me the, the hardest, um, it's in the hiring or leading process. It's how to lead or how to be a good leader to the people we hired. And yeah, I have sometimes troubles to sleep because of that. but. Else, we are quite. Um, um, well, no, we haven't had yet a big failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is fine. It's that's good. Yeah. Um, it's part of the experience. Sometimes you know you you have uh, more sunny days than rainy days, mm -hmm. but. Uh, it, it, yeah, it's interesting to see everyone's journey and everyone's experience. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And what do you do uh, personally when you get some downtime? When I have some free time? Yeah. Um. <laughs> Tinker in the lab? 
<laughs> no, 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 no. Um, no, usually, I mean, I have like a little priority. It's really not interesting, but I, <laughs> I try to do sports to keep healthy because I think this is super important for me. Keep doing uh, the startup. Um, I invest a lot of time in my relationship and I see my friends and I clean my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have That's, any pets? No, 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 <laughs> no. I'm not making my life too hard. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not very, it's... Uh, no, but it is, it is, you yeah. know, you might think it's not interesting, but you know that's that's part of the reasons why we do startup grinding because there's <laughs> other people out there who think they're the only crazy person out there doing uh -huh. what they're doing. But yeah. no. there's there's a lot of us who are doing that, and it's interesting to see how each one um, defines their life, what they focus on, and and I think friendship and relationships and mm. your health are very important. If yeah. you you can't be a good CEO, CTO leader of a, of a company if your personal life is not well taken yeah. care of. Yeah, you have to really optimize the body and mind. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, does your equipment, uh, is it attached to a computer or is it based on the computer or do, do you use the computer? Is there a computer program with some of your equipment? Um, so. In our labs, we do attach it to a computer program to have the raw data and see where we can actually, well, test the electrodes. But usually it depends on the customer's device. So it depends on the device that he has, but usually it's connected to uh, an app or, um, well, no, usually it's connected to an app. What I'm having trouble with is mm -hmm. that I also say that I'm equipment poor. Yeah. Because uh, you know, the equip's expensive, but what happens is, is that on my computer, so they'll update Windows. <laughs> yeah. And then the, the software has to be updated. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening is some of these companies that I had equipment before, they sold me the equipment. Now they're, they're charging a fee, a yearly fee. I can understand to a certain extent because they got to pay people that are going to have to change the software to be mm. compatible with the Windows. Yeah. And this is it's getting to be, and it's expensive for me, mm -hmm. then I'm going, oh my God, I have to pay this expensive fee so that I can get the upgrades so that I can operate. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know what you're saying. So um, this is luckily not our problem, but uh, so maybe just to tell you what we are using, we're uh, using an open source software uh, called OpenBCI to collect the data. Uh, we've just miniaturized the device so that we can wear it uh, around. But uh, so it's just open source device, so we don't have to pay anything for it. Uh, we get the data and then we just analyze it in MATLAB. So we have just our algorithm to analyze and that's MATLAB. So uh, we don't have this problem, but that's definitely <laughs> not very user friendly, yeah? the, the updates. Talking again about uh, employees, yeah. what are your, some of your top recommendations for keeping your employees engaged and motivated? Hmm. Um, well, I think giving them responsibilities and freedom, which was a bit of a problem at the beginning, but mm -hmm. when they know it, they really kind of grow into it because they feel important. I, mean, I, I think this is one of the feedback that we get from everyone, also people who come for internship for two and a half months. They say, I know everything I work on, it's gonna be, it, it's gonna be strategically used in your product development. So you feel that it makes a difference. Mm. Um, yeah, so that, I don't know if big corporates have enough topics to be relevant, but I think relevance uh, is important. Uh, second would be to care about them, like on a personal and professional level. Like sometimes ask, are you happy? What do you think we should change? Um, how do you see your role in the company? And 
yeah, having a lot of fun also. I mean, it's important to mm -hmm. to game, <laughs> to play, to play. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One other thing. So he was asking about employee and how you. So you're writing software. So I'm going to bring up that magic word of agile. Mm. <laughs> yes. Well, you just answered my question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think it's a it's a it's a nice buzzword, like a lot of buzzwords out there. Um, yeah, our problem is more that we have to bring in structure. It's not to have loose structure because we change a lot and uh, we have one input and then we might change everything and everyone is connected to another so it changes very fast. Uh, so our problem is a bit different. It's more like how to bring in more structure in the company and in the engineering more than being super agile. But it's definitely a buzzword. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, do, do you have a model that you use in, in any way or shape or Yeah, we have a theoretical model or something that... We, no, I have to be honest. Um, we always push this to the next strategical meeting to have this model. Um, we, no, we actually don't. We try to... Uh, so maybe the structure that we implemented, which is really helpful, is the Open Friday. Uh, so every Friday, everyone in the company, and we can do it because we're not like 20, uh, so everyone presents what he's working or she's working on and the challenges that they have. So you kind of always have this discussion and you know what everything, everyone is doing. Um, but yeah, we are not very structured <laughs> yet. <laughs> So, and, and did you ha ever have the ego clash with the employees, specifically yeah. based on uh, like sometime if they are more uh, uh, like they are older than you or have more experience, let's say in corporate, and then because you have a conviction, a vision towards the company, while they come from experience of a structure mm -hmm. that they have been implementing in this corporate that you said, and then sim they are simply not listening, like hey, you don't know because you are way too young for to understand that. Like this kind yeah, of no, we never, we never had this, like, we are older, more experienced, what are you talking to me about? Um, it's more that they didn't realize that they had the freedom. Um, because usually, yeah, I mean, one of our, uh, one of the women that worked for us, she, she really came from four years of, you don't give inputs, we don't want to hear your innovation. And she's like, yeah, she's this uh, crazy engineer and now she has the chance to do it, but she also has to get used to it that she's not going to be shut down and that she has the freedom. So it's more like they have to understand they have the freedom. And the thing is that we, we are not telling them uh, what to do. Exactly. Um, so if we are hiring people who have more experience, we are asking them, how would you do it? Um, and um, so they don't feel like this, they don't, well, we give them the power kind of, so um, yeah, <laughs> if that answers it. Yeah. How do you find people to hire? I mean, how do you advertise your open positions? Because I think it's quite difficult for a startup to make themselves known and to mm -hmm. attract people, right? So um, the first hire uh, round that we did, we were on, I think, jobs.ch, those platform uh, in Switzerland. And then, well, we, there was also the startup speed dating from the ETH, which is quite good. Um, and it was also good for us because we then hired people who were not too expensive, like we could afford them. I mean, some, yeah, we could afford them. Uh, and this time, um, there's also people that we already know that we want to have them in our company uh, from network. Uh, and we kind of say, so are you happy in your job? <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're doing a financing round, so we keep them warm. Um, so there are a few that we are hiring like this. And uh, we also put it on our website, LinkedIn, and jobs.ch to, yeah, to get the visibility. 
but the network is quite important. Yeah. Um, I have one or two more questions, and then you know, we'll be wrapping up. So if you guys also have any last questions, um, what advice would you have for an entre entrepreneur who's wearing several hats? That's yeah, I have one. Um, I always say uh, you should be good at what you're good at and let other people be better at what you think you're good but you're not really good at uh, <laughs> so it's because I think sometimes there is also like this ego part that comes up and like so I'm that so I have to do that but maybe you're not that good you're gonna find someone better mm -hmm. so um, allow people who are better to wear one hat yeah um, and it's delegate mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah I think yeah you can delegate a lot of things and focus. I would focus on on what you really are good at. Right. Yeah. That's true. Um, we have a short series of what we like to call rapid fire questions. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, Not sure. <laughs> 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 but just the first thing that comes to mind. Oh, yeah. Um, so, for example, what is one item that you own that you wouldn't, that you would never want to sell? Uh, wedding ring of my grand grandmother. What is your most unusual skill? Um, <laughs> I can do weird stuff with my tongue. <laughs> Once we turn off the camera, do we get a demo? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm going to challenge you. Uh, what's more important, strength, speed, or stamina? Stamina. What's Thanks. your favorite season of the year? Is it easier? Um, winter. And when was the last time you tried something new? Hmm. Um, wow, I should know that. <laughs> uh, do you like trying new things or do you like stability? Are you here? You're really getting the, 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 <laughs> the hard question. Um, I actually need stability, uh, but uh, I like trying new things. Mm. Team or single founder? Team, definitely. Team, team. Cats or dogs? Cats. Wine or beer? <laughs> Wine. I'm from Valais. <laughs> Wine. And favorite app on your phone? Sorry, wearable. The, the, the favorite app? Favorite app. Telegram. What's uh, something on your bucket list? <laughs> <laughs> Have a family. Um, if you could choose the attribute of an animal, what would you choose? An attribute? Or an animal. An animal? Yeah. If you could be an animal or if you could have the attribute of an animal. Um, oh, yeah. Um, breathing underwater. That would be fun. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening and <laughs> everything you. you shared with us. It was uh, really interesting and um, I think uh, everyone was able to learn something special tonight. And So cool. thank you for your time and your honesty with us. Yeah, really thank you for inviting. Yeah.